Love. We hear the word all the time. I love you. I love pizza. I love vampires. I love Megan Fox. I love Justin Bieber. I love texting. But what is love? Is it a feeling, an action, a thought, or just nothing at all? Is love real? Have you ever seen love? Have you felt it? Can you touch it? Do we really understand love? So what is love? Some have said love is patient, kind, and definitely not jealous, proud, rude, and definitely not easily angered. Oh, and love loves truth. Does this sound like the love that you know? Is this the kind of love we see on TV, at the movies, or in texting? The kind of love we see at school, or at the mall, or are written on the Facebook wall? Real love comes from love. Let me explain. God is love. And that may sound weird, but it's true. The creator of the universe is full of love, and he loves us. Let me say that again. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you so much that he was willing to do whatever it took so you could know his love and that you could know him. God loves you so much that he sent his son, his only son, to die for you so that you would not be lost, but you would be found and have eternal life, an eternal life of love. God offers you his love, his saving, life-changing love. Will you accept his love? Children have a way of putting sometimes some difficult truths or asking some, you know, difficult questions. And if you're a parent, you, you know what it is to be asked some of these questions by your kids. Some of you that have little two-year-olds, just get ready because it's coming. They're going to ask you things like, who made God? You know, or mommy, uh, what makes water wet? Uh, stuff like that. Or, or other questions like, okay, if, if Mary was... Jesus is mommy, then why don't they live in heaven with his daddy, you know? And they're going to give you all kinds of questions that you're going to have to try to, to solve. And, and this is our series for four weeks this summer, um, Like a Child, questions that, that kids ask. And our, our core scripture here is one that you're aware of, Luke 18, 16. I know you've heard this before. Um, it says, then Jesus called them to him and said, allow the children to come to me. Don't forbid them because God's kingdom belongs to people like these children. And we talk a lot about the kingdom of God here at the gathering. And this is another entry here. Is that uh, a couple weeks ago, you remember I was preaching about how questions are good? Well, here we are with some questions. So uh, I'm looking forward to this. As adults, we still have some things that stump us. And uh, like I said, for four weeks, we're going to go through some questions. Um, and I've taken these, each one of them comes off a, a note, a question that another church used um, of their kids as they wrote these questions to God. And this is today's. Um, it says, Dear God, I bet it's very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. Nan. Isn't that cute? Yeah, it's like she's in our family, right? She can never love every, all of everybody. And we hear you, Nan. It's, it's a difficult thing to try to understand, uh, this love of God for everybody. It's, it's huge. It's complicated. Uh, I came across some other statements from children. when They were asked, ages four through eight, what is love? Here's just a few of them. Marianne, age four, says, love is when your puppy licks your face even after you let him alone all day. Well, yeah. Uh, Mark, age six, says, love is when mommy sees daddy on the toilet and she doesn't think it's gross. <laughs> yeah. Nika, age six, says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. That's how you learn how to love. And Tommy, age six, says, love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. <clears throat> One more, or two more, uh, Carl, age five, says, love is when girls put on perfume and boys put on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. That's, that's getting close, isn't it? We go out and smell each other. 
And then Elaine, age five, says, love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Well, kids know something about love. You know, the Bible is really a book of love. We don't think about this much, but it is. The whole story from beginning to end um, is about love. And when, when Christians are asked to cite one attribute of God, they say God is love three times more than what they say anything else, more than powerful or, you know, one attribute, more than being almighty or being everywhere. Christians say number one answer is that God is love. And I think that belief is really accurate because in every story from the Garden of Eden all the way through to the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation, there's just story after story about God's unfailing, endless love. You know, the whole thing is a story of his endless, faithful love for every person in the world. And this is where the rub is, kind of, so to speak, because just like little Nan that writes the note, um, she probably speaks for us as well. For when we say all or everyone, eh, it makes it a little bit less digestible. You know, because some things pop into our mind. God loves everyone. Maybe if you say it quickly, you can get by with it. Or maybe if you say, God loves, and accent the loves, and then say, everyone. You won't really stumble on it too much. Of course, we have to read John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but have eternal life. God loved the world, the, the created world, the fallen created world with people in it that mess up, people that don't ever love God, people that hate God, people that will never love God. God loves that world. And this is where we get caught kind of in the injustice of this, of love being wasted on those who really don't want it, those who curse him, those who hate him. I mean, we, we are, I think, somewhat here with Nan. This is kind of hard to, to take in um, with the four people in our family. You know, it's, it's hard to unconditionally love them. Uh, sometimes they're unlovable. And we say God loves everyone. God loves the unlovable ones. Yeah. There are some famous unlovable ones. You know, uh, last year, uh, Forbes magazine said that... Um, Vladimir Putin, the, I don't know what he is for Russia now. He was something else. Now they made him. He's, he's the ruler of, of Russia. He's just not always entitled. They say that he's the most unlovable man in the world, is what Forbes magazine decided. Because he's KGB, he's ruthless, he's kind of mean, he's uh, very powerful and very rich. And they say he's the most unlovable man. And we say, okay, God loves Vladimir yeah. There's some other famous ones, you know, usually we mention people like Hitler or Stalin or Idi Amin, guys like that. We insist that they are in the world as well, and God loves the world. God loves everyone, regardless of who they are. And Nan wants to know, how does God do that? How do you do that, God? How do you love everyone, even the unlovable ones? Probably more troubling for us is the unlovable ones that we live around that we work with, that we know well, uh, people who don't do what they said that they would do, people who kind of act like big shots and push other people around, people who are arrogant, people who are nasty, um, people who are self-centered and, and just non-stop talkers, have something to say about everything, people who uh, complain and whine and, you know, don't clean up their, people you know. We all know some unlovable people. We may be on the list of unlovable for somebody else. But what about them? People who, you know, you work with or live by you. or It's, it's just a whole lot easier to say God loves these unlovable ones, these famous ones in theory. But when it comes to people that we know, to say God loves them the same way that God loves me, that's just a little bit more difficult. So I thought we might amend this just a little bit. Uh, how about uh, God loves those who love him? That sounds fair, doesn't it? God loves those. We, we could go a step further. God loves us first and then 
continues to love us if we love him back. Doesn't that make a whole lot more sense? Huh? How about this? How about God loves those he knows will love him back? You know, so we get into this, you know, omnipotence of God and sovereignty. God knows that we're going to love him, so he loves us first knowing that we're going to love him back. So then we could change this, John 3.16, so God so loved some of the world. Now, that, that just doesn't that sound better? God loves some of the world. The Bible asserts over and over that God is a God of love, and he loves everyone all the time. All the same. Let's just, you know, choke on that. God shows no partiality. Remember, that's what he taught Peter when he was trying to teach Peter that the, the gospel just isn't for the Jews, but it's for the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And, and Peter finally says, I now realize that God shows no partiality. He loves all people the same. 1 John 4, 8 says, The person who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. There we get that statement, God is love, so simple. And we get that, and, and sometimes people take it and they just kind of run with it, you know. Oh, God is love, I get it. I know what love is. Love is like when I'm out of money and I go to my mom and I act like I'm sick and I act, and I act like I'm sad and she gets out her checkbook. Yeah, that must be what God is like. So if God loves me, then that means that He's never going to do anything that I don't like, right? Because love is kind of this mushy, kind, puppy dog lick kind of thing. And some people go that way and they say, God is love, so nothing bad will ever happen. And when we talk about God and love, the reality is, is that we learn about love from God rather than learning about God from love. See, I know that sounds like I'm double-talking you, but we really learn about love from the way God is. Now, the love we know is always conditional. Human love is always conditional. Even at our best, we are conditional. All of us have that place where we get to the point where we say, I just can't do anymore. Okay? Yes, I love you, but. There's always a but on it. That's the kind of human love that we have. But we learn about God's love, that that love is used in relation to God is, is just kind of extravagant, just weirdly extravagant. I, I love to use the word extravagant with God's love. I think it fits better than anything else. Um, God's love is just over the top. God's love just doesn't make any sense to us sometimes. Uh, it doesn't follow a good business plan. Last week we had, remember that, that parable about the shepherd that leaves the 99 to go look for the one? That's a terrible business plan, right? Yeah, God, God, cut your losses, you know? You lost one, so what? But God's love is just extravagant. God loves people who hate him. It just doesn't make any sense to us unless you're God or you want to follow. And then, you know, you start learning about what love is from him. One of the reasons why God's love is so extravagant is because he has just this endless supply. It just never runs out. Uh, he, he loves millions of people who will never acknowledge that he's even alive. Uh, it just inexhaustible. Uh, he, he can waste love on unlovable people because he has more. Always, it's like what I would call infinity squared. You know what infinity is? Well, just square it. And there, you're starting to uh, grasp the, this love. It's just endless. So it's never wasted. I think the best example that I thought of in the Bible was, was that of Jonah. You, you know the story of Jonah and the whale, kid's story. You know, they love that story. It's really a very adult story. It's really not a child story. And let, let me just fill you in just a little bit. It's not really about the fish and being in the whale and, you know, seaweed all over you and stuff like that. Really, it's, it's, it's more about uh, this adult story where, where God sends Jonah to Nineveh. And Nineveh is this really, really nasty, wicked city. Just, you know, like makes Sodom and Gomorrah look good. And so God sends Jonah, his prophet there, and Jonah says, I'm going the other way. 
So instead of headed east, he goes west, gets on a ship and heads out to Tarshish. And on the way there, he ends up in the water through a series of things. And this big fish swallows him. And Jonah's got three days in the belly of the fish to think things over and get right. And while he's there thinking about this, the fish is moving towards the shore of Nineveh. <laughs> You know, he says, well, you want to go that way? I'm going to take you this way. And finally, Jonah has this uh, kind of come to Jesus moment. And uh, the reason that he doesn't want to go to Nineveh is because it's filled with pagans. And he says, I know if I go there, I know what you're like, God. Uh, I'm going to preach to them, and they're going to repent, and you're going to forgive them. And so I'm not going there because I don't want those people forgiven. And yet God loves these sinners at Nineveh just as much as what he loves the best Jew. So while he's, uh, when he has this come to Jesus moment, it's in Jonah 4.2, he says this. He prayed to the Lord, come on, Lord, wasn't this precisely my point when I was back in my own land? This is why I fled to Tarshish earlier. I know that you are a merciful and compassionate God, very patient, full of faithful love and willing not to destroy. He says, I know who you are, God. You're merciful and compassionate. You don't give people what they deserve. You give them your love. And I know what you're like. And that phrase that he uses here is used five times in the Old Testament. Each time, it's a signature revelation of who God is. This is what God is like. God is merciful and compassionate, very patient, God loves all. And that was what Jonah knew, for he knew that the Lord, and he knew he would forgive them. And the, the end of the story is that's what happens. He, he ends up there in, in Nineveh, and he preaches a very short sermon. And they go, yeah, we'll receive. God's love is extravagant. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us sometimes, because it's more than we can comprehend. In the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, Paul has this wonderful prayer. Um, he says, this is why I kneel before the Father. Every ethnic group in heaven or on earth is recognized by him. I ask that he will strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the Spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith. As a result of having strong roots in love, I ask that you have the power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth together with all believers. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. That last phrase, I, I, I want you to be to know the love of God that's beyond knowledge. I mean, isn't that kind of a non-illogical uh, statement? You, sh you should know the love of God that's beyond knowledge so you'll be filled with the fullness of God. And Paul, Paul, Paul prays for them and for us that we will have, uh, understand, you know, grasp this love of God that he says is so huge, the height, the width, the depth, all, depth, all that stuff. It means that we will be so struck by the extravagant love of Christ, okay, that it will be really unimaginable, unknowable. Kind of like little Nan, you know, who wrote the note. We'll just say, I don't understand. I don't get it. I don't know why God would do it this way. And again, God is telling us something about love. Nancy uh, Spiegelberg said, Lord, I crawled across the barrenness to you with an empty cup. If only I had known you better, I would have come running with a bucket. I love that image. If we really knew who God was, we would come running with everything that we have. Well, uh, know that it's just extravagant. Now, the next thing I want to impress upon us is that love is tough. That's a popular phrase that we use a lot about tough love. Uh, you've heard the saying tough love. Well, God invented this. Okay, uh, pop psychologist didn't invent it, but God did. Tough love means that God loves us enough that he does what is right for us, even when it hurts him. Okay, Proverbs 3.12, which is also uh, quoted in, in Hebrews 12.6, says, The Lord loves those he corrects, just like a father who treats his son with favor. He says, God is like a father 
He corrects us. He disciplines us. That's tough love. God corrects us. I mean, love doesn't mean that you just get to do what you want to do when you want to. It's exactly the opposite. Love waits. Love sacrifices. Love often endures pain. So there's going to be some joy in the future. Love teaches us. Uh, God teaches us about love this way. And he waits for us always to to wake up and to turn. Uh, God disciplines. God love disciplines. And we learn uh, that about uh, love from God. Um, obviously, parents don't give kids everything they want. If you love your child, you shouldn't give them everything that they ask for because they don't know enough to ask for some things, right? They're going to ask for stupid things. So, so God doesn't give us things that will hurt us, but, but God makes us wait. And God, you know, we need to mature sometimes, as I, as I say. Another time around the wilderness... Um, the, the, the story about the, the Israelites out there for 40 years in the wilderness. And I always like it. Sometimes uh, Bible maps, it'll show, you know, here's the wandering of the Israelites in the wilderness as they were getting to the promised land. And usually there's one area where it'll just have a circle with, air, with arrows going around it because we're not really sure everywhere they went. But for, for about 30 years, we think they were in one area just going around in circles you know, do you feel like that some days? Like, you know, I look back over the last 10 years, and I feel like I've just been kind of going in circles in my life. And, and we say, just another time around the wilderness until we finally get it. And that's what God does for us. Tough love. I came across a letter that Abraham Lincoln wrote to his stepbrother, uh, John Johnston. He wrote him, uh, and his stepbrother did, and asked for a loan of some money so he could settle some debts like he had done before. And on previous occasions, uh, Lincoln just gave him the money, but he just kept coming back. So Lincoln wrote him this tough love letter. He says, Dear Johnston, your request for $80 I do not think it best to comply with now. At the various times when I have helped you a little, you have said to me, we can get along very well now, but in a very short time I find you in the same difficulty again. Now, this can only happen by the same defect in your conduct. <clears throat> you know the letter's turning there. What that defect is, I think I know. You are not lazy, and still you are an idler. I doubt whether, since I saw you, you have, had, have done a good whole day's work in any one day. This habit of uselessly wasting time is your whole difficulty. It's vastly important to you, and still more to your children, that you should break the habit. You are now in need of some money, and what I propose is that you shall go to work, tooth and nail, for somebody who will give you money for it, and to secure you a fair reward for your labor, I now propose you that for every dollar you will, between this and the first day of May, get for your own labor, I will give you one other dollar. Now, if you will do this, you will soon be out of debt, and what is better, you will have a habit that will keep you from getting in debt again. But if I should now clear you out of debt next year, you would be just as deep in as ever. Affectionately, your brother, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> it's a good brother, isn't it? Yeah. He does the tough love thing. That, that's kind of speaking the truth and love, as Paul says in Ephesians 4. It's tough love. It's God's love. But of all the lessons about the love of God, none compare to the gift of Jesus Christ. God's love uh, shown us. God shows us his love in Jesus. Jesus is the love of God in human form. There's nothing about that love that we need to learn uh, apart from Jesus. Everything he did was about love. And remember that he wasn't always nice. He wasn't always agreeable with people. He told the Pharisees that they were a bunch of snakes. Okay? still trying to wake them up, get them to turn to him. That's tough love. He got angry in love. Uh, remember when he cleaned out the temple, the, they, they were having kind of a flea market set up there in the temple, and Jesus it says, makes a whip out of cords. Can, can you imagine them standing there, him pulling together some cords and saying, just a minute, I, I'm going to beat these guys with these cords in a minute, but I've got to make a good whip first. Deliberate anger based in love. Everything Jesus did was motivated by love. 1 John 4.10, 
says, This is love. It is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the sacrifice that deals with our sins. There, you know, John is saying God shows us his love in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the way he puts it. We, we know love because God sent his son for a sacrifice for our sins. This, this is the real thing. That night in the upper room when, you know, they were preparing for the Passover meal. Remember, the disciples had been arguing with each other as to which one of them was the number one disciple. That was a conversation that they were having. Which one of them was best? Jesus took off his outer coat, put a towel around his waist, knelt before them and washed their feet. And he said that night, he said, a new commandment I give to you, love one another. And they knew exactly what he meant when he said love one another. It wasn't that puppy dog, mushy, you know, affection, but it was sacrifice for each other. Later on, when they were at the table that night, do you understand that while they were eating at that table, one of the men that was sitting next to him was Judas? It says that Judas dipped his bread in the sop. That means he was sitting next to Jesus. Jesus ate his last meal on this earth with the man that betrayed him. Now that's love, isn't it? And he said, you know, I know who's going to betray me. And they all got really nervous. Judas is sitting right there. Wow. And then later on, when the, the Romans had him and they were torturing him, really torturing him, beating him, <clears throat> he was silent, it says. He could have said, man, you guys are going to be so sorry in about three days. He could have said, I'm going to get you for this. But he was silent. Later on, after he was dead, uh, the centurion would... The centurion was a Roman soldier who had, was in charge of the whole crucifixion scene. Had been standing there when Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the centurion looked at his dead body and said, Surely this man is the Son of God. And he knew that because of the way that Jesus had loved them all the way through death. And God the Father sends us this message. The message is so simple. So simple for a child to understand. God does not love you because you've been so good. God does not love you because you know someone so important. God does not love you because you promise to be good in the future. God the Father loves you because, well, he wants to be your father. We all need a heavenly father. We all need the love of God in our lives. And that's his simple message to us, is that I would like for you to be my son. I would like for you to be my daughter. Let's sit in prayer for a minute. As deep cries out.